foxholes. And I started thinking about that, and the author of the book uh, explained that what he meant was people who don't even believe in God and say that they don't believe in God at all, when they get into a situation where they are at the end of their rope, they feel hopeless, they feel out of control, there's nothing else that they can do except hunker down and just try to stay alive, that's when they will often turn to God and pray, even though they say they don't believe in him. And I call that calling 911 Jesus. Anybody ever called 911? I called 911 on the beach a couple weeks ago because a catamaran had flipped out in the water and he could not get that thing back up and it was going out and out and out. So we called and the lifeguards came swooping in uh, on their jet skis. It was pretty cool to watch and they helped the guy flip the catamaran back up. So, so we call 911 in times of great crisis and to be honest, if you think about it, you call 911 and the firefighter comes in, or maybe you'll, you'll call a tow truck and they'll come and, and take your car and fix it, or you'll, you'll have to go to a doctor in, in the case of, a, of an emergency, and, uh, or maybe you get arrested and you have to call an attorney. Uh, but most of the time in that situation, we want them to swoop in and help us, and then we'd really rather not ever really have to talk to them again, right? We'd rather not have to need those firefighters or that emergency paramedic. Uh, you know, unless they live right next door to us, we really don't even want to build a relationship with them. Um, we would just, just as soon not talk to them again. And a lot of us, uh, if we admit it, ha we treat Jesus that way as well. And I can tell you in my life, I've been very guilty of that. Uh, some of you know a lot of my story. Uh, the rest of you are going to learn it little by little. Um, but I will tell you that I grew up in the church and I gave my life to Christ when I was 11. And then I just kind of said, okay, Jesus, uh, you go over here and you stay right there and I'll call you when I need you. So sure enough, if I had something happening at school that uh, was really stressful, I would call 911 Jesus, come and help me with this test, or I just had a breakup, come and help me through this breakup. But that whole uh, atheists in foxholes, that became real to me during Desert Storm. Uh, most of you know that Spencer, my husband, was a Navy pilot, and he flew during Desert Storm uh, the very first night of the war. He was flying, and so when you watched those videos of the AAA firing going up and looked like fireworks, when you, any of you that watched that on CNN or saw films of that, they were shooting at my husband. Yeah, really, truly. And so I called 911 every single day during that war. I call, I prayed more than I've ever prayed in my whole life. And, you know, please get him home safely. And I made all these promises. And here's the thing that I learned. God doesn't want to just be our 911 Jesus. He wants more. And, and he will come and get you. And ta-da. This, this probably won't happen to you, but you, you could end up being a pastor <laughs> or something. He wants more. And that's what we're going to talk about today is that Jesus has the power to act. He has the power and the love of God to act, but he doesn't just want to swoop in and be our superhero. He doesn't want to just be in 911. Jesus wants to do more for us, but he wants more in return as well. So we're going to talk about that this morning, and we're going to read a story of two people who call 911 Jesus. They just want him to swoop in and touch them and, and solve their problems. And this is a long story, and so if you'll bear with me this morning, what I'd like to do is something a little different. Instead of reading the whole passage, I'd like to read a little bit, talk about it. I want to separate the two people, if we can, in this passage. So we're going to read this. Let's pray together first. Holy God, as we get into this word this morning, we ask that you and only you would speak to our hearts and minds, silence all the other things that are going around in our heads, and we ask that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and the courage to respond. May you be glorified in these moments. Have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is from Mark's Gospel, and it's in chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel. We've been in Mark's Gospel a little bit in the last few weeks. And we're going to start with verse 21, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter, but we're going to do it a little bit at a time. So hear this. Let me give you the background first. Jesus has been traveling around the Sea of Galilee. We read about him calming the storm last week. He's been traveling, and in this, he's now done some pretty astounding things. He's calmed a storm with a word we talked about last week. He healed the leopard. Uh, we didn't read the story, but he fed 5,000 people uh, with, just a word, you know, with just a little bit of food. He's healed a blind man. He's done some extraordinary things. So now there's this huge crowd following him. Uh, and, and wanting to be healed, many of them are just wanting to, they, they, they realize that this guy can heal people with just a touch. And so huge, massive crowds of people are following. So listen to what happens here. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large cat crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. 
He pleaded earnestly, earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A cr large crowd followed and pressed around him. Let's pause right there and let's make sure we understand who Jairus is or Jairus. It depends on how you pronounce it. Uh, but this is a man he is called a synagogue ruler. That does not mean he's the pastor or the priest in the synagogue. The synagogue ruler would be a trustee. He would be their version of Claire Mitchell. He is, he is employed by the Pharisees and the leaders of the synagogue to take care of the building. And, he had, and that's a prestigious position. And so here was a man with some prestige and some power and authority in the community. But make no mistake, he probably was not a Jesus follower. You guys, I probably don't have to tell you if you're at church, you probably know the Pharisees did not like Jesus. They didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't trust Jesus. They persecuted Jesus. They're the very ones that, as we'll read later, made sure that Jesus got crucified. So they were not fans of Jesus. So chances are that this man, Jairus, was not a Jesus fan. And yet he was desperate. His daughter was dying. It was a foregone conclusion. She was definitely going to die. He was the atheist in the foxhole. He probably didn't believe in Jesus, didn't really want to know Jesus, but he certainly wanted the touch of Jesus. So he came, and even though he had a, uh, authority, this is pretty extraordinary. Like the leper, he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he said, please come and heal. Just touch my daughter. 911, just come and touch her. And I love that Jesus went immediately. Did you notice that? I love that about Jesus. And I'm pretty sure Jesus had a plan. He probably had a sermon prepared. He was ready. But he didn't care. He went immediately and followed Jairus. I love that. Remember that about Jesus. Jesus always has time for you. Always. He is interruptible. We'll talk about that some more in a minute. So they're rushing off. Let's pick up the story now in verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many uh, of the, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Let's stop there. That's a lot. That's, a power. That's one of my favorite stories in the Bible right there. Let's think this through. So Jesus is traveling, uh, and he's rushing, I'm sure, because Jairus' daughter is dying, and he's rushing, and this crowd is following because they're like, okay, there's a healing, but I want to see what's going to happen. I think that was a lot of it. They're following Jesus, and this woman comes up who's been bleeding for 12 years. Understand what that means in that culture at the time. This is a female hemorrhaging type of bleeding. In that culture, if you were bleeding at all, you were considered ceremonially unclean, which means you had to separate from people much like the leper that we talked about a couple weeks ago. So she would have had to isolate. If anybody's ever read that wonderful book, The Red Tent, that's what The Red Tent is about. It's this place that they, it was a separate tent that they would actually go and stay in while they were menstruating. And so this woman, 12 years, has to be isolated from her friends and her family. And she's really suffered. So think about her, the isolation that she was experiencing. But then on top of that, we're told that she had gone to many, many doctors and that she had spent all she had and just got worse. Now, you guys, I don't have to tell you about medical bills. I had surgery a couple years ago, and one day I got in the mail, $80,000. Yeah, I'll just go get that out of my sock drawer because I got that right. $80,000. It wasn't even a major surgery. $80,000. My insurance company paid that. They paid like $2,000 and everybody was happy. That's the way the system works, right? But so this is this woman. She had to pay that. All of her money. So at this point, she is suffering. She is isolated. 
She is probably destitute and probably so discouraged because she spent all she had and had nothing left. And so she thinks, I'm going to do a sneak attack on Jesus. I'm just going to sneak up on him, touch his cloak, because she's not allowed to be public. She's bleeding. It's against the law, just like the leper. So she's just going to sneak in and touch his cloak. And it's amazing to me because she touches his cloak and they were told that she stopped bleeding immediately. We've heard that word before, haven't we? Over and over again. I, I would challenge you, if you have a concordance Bible, go look up the word immediately and see how often Jesus acts immediately. He has the power to act immediately. Immediately she stopped bleeding, but then something else happened. So we know that she's healed, but then she says she felt inside of herself that her suffering was over. Something in the atmosphere changed with the mere touch, the brush of Jesus' clothes. My friends, something in your atmosphere will change when you encounter Jesus. Something will change, and she felt that. And Jesus, we're told, felt power go out of him. We talked about this last week. Make no mistake, I, that's not an accidental sentence. When Jesus acts, when Jesus moves in the life, that is in a movement of power, the very power of God. We've already talked about that. But I love this because I think that, you guys, I've told you, I think Jesus is so funny. Because I don't think Jesus was just kind of, you know, I'm walking through the crowd. I think Jesus knew she was coming. We already talked about Jesus knows everything about us. Jesus is omniscient. He is the very power of Almighty God. So you know Jesus knew she was coming. And I think Jesus was just kind of, I want to the crowd, wait for it, wait for it. Ah, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. And his disciple goes, uh, there's a thousand people here. Of course someone touched me. He goes, oh no, someone touched me. Who was it? Who was it? See, and here's the thing that's so crazy about that. The healing was done. She was okay. She was good to go. She could have snuck right back out, disappear incognito. Except Jesus knew she was there. And Jesus, rushing to, to, to heal this girl, could have said, okay, that's done. I took care of that. Let's go. But he didn't. He stopped and he said, who touched me? And because something had changed in her atmosphere, we don't know why, this woman identified herself to Jesus in great fear and trembling and threw herself at Jesus' feet. We've heard that before. My friends, Jesus kept looking for her because Jesus isn't interested in 911 healing. That's not what he wants. Jesus wants to offer more, but Jesus also expects more. And so he wasn't just going to let her swoop in and sneak in and sneak out. He wanted something from her. And she did exactly what he wanted. She threw herself at Jesus' feet, which means throwing herself at Jesus' mercy because what she's doing is against the law. She put her very life in Jesus' hands. Because if he had said, you're not supposed to be here. You're bleeding. You're not allowed to touch me. That crowd could have ripped her apart. That might have happened, but that's not what Jesus did. She threw herself, gave her very life at his mercy, at his footsteps. And I love what Jesus did. He looked down at her and he said, daughter, daughter. So this woman who was isolated, alone, destitute, probably felt hopeless. Now he has not only spoken with her, he called her daughter. He included her in the family of Almighty God. But also in that culture, when you call someone daughter, that means she is under my power and my guidance and my provision and my protection. Don't cross me. I've got her. That's what he was doing there. So now she was no longer in danger. He protected her. He went to bat for her. He healed her. And we're told that he listened to her whole truth. My friends, has anyone ever sat down and listened to your whole truth? Your whole story, every word of it? We have to pay people to do that, don't we? Don't we? And even then, they're not, you're not even sure they're listening. He listened to her whole story. He wants to know you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to know your whole story and be a part of your whole story. He doesn't want to just swoop in and heal. And once he finds that, hears that story, and, and builds that relationship, he says, daughter, you're mine. I've got you. And then he said, your faith has healed you. And I love this because the word healed there, this is where words become important. The word healed right there, the Greek word is sozo, 
and it means saved. It is the same word that they use throughout the Bible when they're talking about being saved by the Messiah, receiving salvation from the Messiah. What he's saying is not that your faith has healed you of your bleeding. Your faith has saved you for eternity. You are now the daughter of the one true God. Do you see the difference? She came for a healing, a physical healing, and she got it immediately. Immediately. He has that power, and and she got it, but she got more than that. She got a relationship. She got inclusion into the family of God. She got eternity, and he says, go in peace. I've got you. You're okay. Go in peace. We can find peace in knowing that God is interruptible, that Jesus can act in power immediately, that he's interruptible. He was busy, and yet he stopped and heard her whole story. Jesus would love for you to call 911. He will always answer. He will always listen. But he offers more, and he expects more. He wants a relationship. Meanwhile, Jairus. Jesus! My daughter, she's dying. Jesus, come on, what are you talking about? She's healed. Come on, let's go. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? He must have been furious. Let's pick up the story. Verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kaum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. I love that. So Jairus, at this point, is probably furious. And they come and say, your daughter's dead. Don't even bother with him anymore. How many of us have been in that situation where we ask Jesus, 911, Jesus, come and save me, come and heal me doesn't and you're like I'm done with you I'm not going to bother with you anymore I'm not even going to ever call on you again has that happened in your life I remember I, I can tell you some of my family members my dad had cancer when I was 20 years old and we prayed and prayed and prayed and he passed away anyway and, and I have family members that are done with Jesus because of that because they called 911 and he didn't do what they wanted and uh, Tim Keller, I don't know if you guys, Tim Keller is a pastor, a Presbyterian pastor up in New York City, and he wrote a great book called King's Cross. And in that book, he talks about this scene, and he said, Jesus committed what would be medical malpractice in America. He had the life-threatening emergency situation, and he put it on hold while he, ha- or the, you know, the acute situation, and he put it on hold while he handled the chronic situation, long-term, non-life-threatening. And actually, by the time he got involved in that, she was already healed. And not only did he leave that one to the side and spend time on this one, he took the time to chit-chat and to hear her story. And he says, Jarius was probably already calling a medical malpractice attorney. Or they were lining it up already, because that's a, that's a, you know, that's a textbook case. And sure enough, she died, and, and they said, don't even bother with him anymore. And then Jesus again because he doesn't just want to be 911, swoop in and swoop out. He said, don't be afraid, just believe. He said that to Jairus. And let's recognize what he was saying to Jairus right here. He was saying, trust me. Just like the woman had to throw herself at Jesus' feet and trust Jesus, Jesus is taking this even a step further. Because you know what? It's pretty easy to trust Jesus with your own well-being. You that are parents, how hard is it to trust somebody to trust Jesus with the life of your child. He's saying, trust me with the most tender, vulnerable part of your heart. 
trust me with the very life of your 12-year-old daughter. That's a deeper commitment, and that's what Jesus was asking for right there. And so Jairus had to trust Jesus and go with Jesus, and they get to Jairus' house, and everybody's crying and wailing because she's dead. And Jesus goes, she's not really dead. She's only asleep. I can't help but think of Billy Crystal in The Princess Bride, one of the best movies ever made, where Billy Crystal goes, she's not really dead. She's only mostly dead. No, my friends, she was all the way dead in this story. But here's the thing about Jesus. Death is just sleeping to Jesus. While you're looking up in the Bible about the word immediately, look up and see. Every single place where there is Jesus in the Bible, there is no death. There is only a healing and a resurrection. Always. Find it. If you can find it, show me. You won't. I've been looking for it. It's not there. Jesus, death is merely sleeping to Jesus. And so he says, I've got you. Trust me. But my friends, the hardest time to just trust Jesus is when he tarries. When we call 911 and we need something from him and he doesn't come through in that moment. Maybe you prayed for your parents to not get divorced and they did anyway. Maybe you prayed for somebody to get better and they didn't. Maybe you prayed for a job and it fell through. And that's the hardest time to trust in the power of God and the love of God when we don't understand why he's taking so long and why he's not doing what we want him to do. But it's because he wants more and he wants to offer more. So Jesus goes into the house with his couple of friends and the mom and dad. And he goes to this little girl and he says, Talitha, Kayom, which means little girl it's time to get up think about it but but the, and I think it's interesting you don't always see the Aramaic in the Bible but they put it in there intentionally because that phrase would be very much like a parent today saying sweetie honey it's time to get up come on come on that's what he was saying and that kind of parental tenderness and guidance he reached out and he didn't just touch her he reached out his hand and he lifted her up 12 years old to life Jairus asked for a healing and got a resurrection. He asked for a touch. And we all know that he could have, Jesus could have touched. He could have put out a word just like he did with the storm. He didn't even have to go there. But instead, Jesus went. He said, trust me. I've got you even when you don't think I've got you. And he reached out a hand and he took her hand. My friends, Jesus doesn't want to just swoop in and touch us and swoop out. He wants to offer us a hand a hand to hold, to guide and protect, minute to minute, every day of our lives, he wants to be connected to us. Jesus is offering that to each of us today, the very power and presence of God who can and will at times act immediately. But there will be times when he won't because it will take us deeper into a relationship, deeper into trust. There will be a time in our lives where we've got to hang on for dear life to the only hand of God as we walk through physical death into eternity. That's the hand that Jesus is offering. And he's offering it to each of us. He doesn't just want to come in, touch your life, and swoop out. He wants to know you. He wants to know your whole truth. He wants to be in a relationship with you. Jesus is offering you that hand, hand of healing, a hand of salvation, a hand of peace, a hand of guidance that will take you through every minute of the day. And you can trust and relax. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even when they die, will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? Do you believe it? Believe it. Take his hand. Walk with him and be at peace. Are you willing to take it today? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, I just thank you so much for the power, for the fact that Jesus is interruptible, that Jesus will always answer our 911 call. But thank you that he wants to be in a deeper relationship with us than just 911. That he offers us more than just that momentary touch. That he offers us a hand to walk us through life and into eternity. Help us to be bold enough to take the hand. Help us to be bold and loving enough to those around us to offer it to others. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.